We're going to begin reading in verse 1, Romans chapter 16. The Bible says, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Centria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also are in Christ before, or were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philologus and Julia, Nerus and his brother, or and his sister, and Olympus and all the saints that are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that you would help us as we look into it to uh, hear your voice in it. As we sang earlier, speak, O Lord. And, and we pray that you would use the, your voice in the scriptures to instruct our hearts and to, and to mold our minds into the image of Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if, if someone who knows you well were to give a one-sentence summary of your life, what would they say? Would they say something about maybe you'd be a, you're a hunter or a fisherman or a woodworker? Or a, would they mention your your vocation, a teacher, mechanic? Um, I'm out of ideas here. Uh, plumber, I guess we have plumbers here. We got to, um, work at Cat or something like that. You know, um, you, you, what what would they say with a one sentence summary? Uh, would they say mother or grandmother or grandfather or or would they just speak about you being a Christian? Would they say Christian or maybe they would they would mention both of those things, you know, maybe a mix of all of those things. But would they say Christian first and foremost of all? I find it interesting that as he concludes his his uh, letter to the Romans, Paul not only names the names of many of his friends, but he also includes a little summary of what those names mean to him. And some of the names evoke more words than others. Some are bunched together with little comment given to, to a whole group bunched together. But all of these names are important and they all have one thing in common. And that is Jesus Christ. And see, Paul, when he gives summaries of their lives, I don't know if he means these as summaries of their life. But when he gives a little comment of what they mean to him, he's mentioning Christ first and foremost of all. And that's no surprise because Paul was full of Christ. And he writes the way a man talks when his heart is full of Christ. Look what Jesus said in uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Here Jesus is speaking to Pharisees. He's speaking to a group of religious men who had just accused him of casting out demons through the devil's power. And Jesus explained why what they were saying was evil and why they would go so far as to speak such evil things. And the reason why is because their hearts were full of evil. And so it was no wonder that evil would overflow from their evil hearts into their mouth and spill out all over the place. In the same way, a heart overflowing with good will speak the good things that overflow from the heart to the mouth. Um, 
I, I had the privilege of working for a well driller when I was uh, in my early 20s for a couple of summers. And uh, one thing that I really liked was sometimes you would get a flowing artesian well. I actually never got to drill one of those, but I, I got to see a couple of those. Uh, and and uh, most wells are, are artesian wells, but there would be some that would be flowing. And what that meant was the water just keeps flowing out of the well. Uh, and, and I kind of get that picture in my mind. I had a friend who had a, who had a cabin on the lake and they had an artesian overflowing well on, on their property, just a cement, probably 10 inch pipe in the water and that well would, or in, in the ground, and that well would flow over and a stream would go to the lake on their property. And on a good hot day, you just stick your head right in there and just, you know, it was awesome. Uh, and, uh, and so I, get, I just get that picture of the heart overflowing into the words of the mouth. And you can kind of tell what your heart is like by what you speak. Not what you say when you're paying attention, but what you say when you're not paying attention. Um, and so Paul's words are full of Christ because his heart is full of Christ. And the things he loves most about his brothers and sisters in Christ are the, re, are the things that result from their faith and their dedication to Christ. And so uh, he can't wait to just talk about that, to write about that. Now, Paul has some practical reasons for naming the names at, that he names at the end of this letter. He probably greeted these people by name because he wanted the church at Rome to receive his letter. And uh, imagine, if you will, the believers assembled together they didn't carry in a Bible bound like we do carry into church, um, but they would receive, the church at Rome would have received this letter and one of them would have stood up in front of the assembly and read the whole letter. And so imagine that going on. The believers are assembled together in a large house in Rome and one person is standing in front of the gathering with Paul's letter in, uh, to the Romans in his hand. He reads the entire letter out loud to the gathered assembly and as the reader reaches the end of the letter, he begins to read uh, these commands for the church to greet certain people. And what it is, is Paul is passing along his greetings. He reads, I commend to you Phoebe. Well, there's Phoebe sitting there who had delivered the letter and she is sitting there in the assembly. He reads, greet Priscilla and Aquila, Mary and Andronicus and Junia, etc. And as each name is read, heads turn and eyes in the room find the owners of those names. And you know, it's kind of fun as a public speaker to mention names and see the reaction. Like I could say, I could say Caleb right now and people will look at him. All right? And then he can feel that. His ears start turning red and look... See, y'all just fell into my ploy right there. It just gives me a feeling of personal power, all right? Uh, so don't indulge me too much. It'll go to my head. But, uh, but Paul is kind of doing that. He's naming names. And as each name is mentioned, people are kind of side-eyeing. You know, they're kind of looking at him. Um, and, and he's greeting trusted individual members of the church. And doing that would lend credibility to what he was um what he was giving to them in that whole letter. Imagine someone in the assembly, uh, in, in that assembled church, uh, the day that Paul's letter, letter was first read. Here's a person sitting there. He's a good Christian. Maybe his name, I'm going to make up a name, right? Maybe his name is Romulus. It's a good Roman name, right? Uh, and he's, he's, uh, he's not named in the letter, but he's an integral part of the church. And he hears some of the names greeted out loud in the church. And so Brother Romulus is sitting there thinking, he's thinking, you know, I was having a difficult time with that part about do not avenge yourselves. I, I, that one was difficult for me. And when Paul wrote that there was none righteous, none, no, not one, there's none that seeks after God when he was writing that. Uh, and when, when they were reading that, I wasn't sure that I actually agreed with that. I, I didn't know if I should believe anything in this letter. But then... Andronicus and Junia, they know Paul. Amplius vouches for him. Rufus is a solid Christian, and he's good friends with Paul. Paul's naming him and his mother. And in this way, greeting several faithful Christians by names helps to serve Paul's purpose of gaining the confidence of that church to receive his letter. Um, now, that's a lot of conjecture on my part, but I, I think... 
I think that's possibly what's going on as far as Paul's immediate uh, reason for doing that. But there's an, there's an equally important, maybe even a more important purpose for these names being given. And it's not necessarily Paul's purpose, but it's the purpose of the Holy Spirit in putting this in Holy Scripture, in inspired Scripture. That is the purpose of the Holy Spirit, um, and he puts it in there for us. Now, why does he do this? I mean, why do we care about some ancient guys that went to church in Rome 2,000 years ago, right? Why, do, why, why does that matter to us? Um, and and why, um, why does he give us more than their names? Why, why the short descriptions here? Well, I think the Holy Spirit intends for these people to be examples for us to follow. What we... Is that... Is that playing over the speakers? No. Oh, okay. All right. Anyway, what we see in these people um, are brief descriptions that should cause us to search our hearts for similar virtues. All right. So Paul begins this chapter by saying, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister. I, I want to borrow his word here, commend. All right. Commend. Because I believe that God in this passage commends to us certain characteristics that he desires for every Christian. Commend, the word commend carries with it the implication that we must accept and honor uh, those who are commended. It's a call to action. And so in, in uh, Romans chapter 16, the first seven verses is where we're going to focus this morning. And here God commands at least four Christian characteristics to us. And I, I want to just consider them one at a time here this morning. And so here's a list of commendable Christian characteristics. Say that 10 times real fast, all right? And I think these are characteristics that we should desire for our lives. I think God wants us, this for us first. God commends the, God, the, uh, the characteristic of gospel service. All service is commendable in its own right. I mean, there are lots of things that you can do to serve other people. But those who serve in the gospel are especially honored by God. If you could be summed up in just one word, you could not do much better than servant and especially gospel servant, servant uh, of God for the gospel. Jesus Christ both taught and modeled this principle. Christ honors gospel servants, and Christ was the ultimate gospel servant. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 42, he says, But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to, to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So here is Jesus teaching about the fact that he honors servants. Those who'd be first would be servants. And then he says, oh, by the way, I came to be a servant. And the way I'm going to do that is lay down my life to pay the ransom, the price for the sins of whoever will trust in me, all who would trust in me. And so this, this, um, it's no wonder that Paul honors people who are servants and who serve to further the gospel. And the first person he honors, her name is Phoebe. All right, and Phoebe is a servant in her church. She serves in her church. Look at verse one. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church at Centria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Now, Phoebe is the only person named here that is not, a, as far as we know, that is not a member of the church at Rome. She's actually from Centria, which is uh, close to Corinth, and a port city for Corinth. Um, and, and Corinth is where Paul was when he wrote this letter. And so it's most likely that Phoebe is the one who carries his epistle to the church at Rome. And so it was important for Paul to commend Phoebe to that church as a sister in Christ. 
And, and, and there's at least one thing the, the world would want to, uh, sorry, excuse me a second, get tongue-tied sometimes. It's because I'm smelling uh, what's going on downstairs. So. But there is at least one thing the world would want to commend about Phoebe. And that is this, Phoebe was probably quite wealthy. She was probably a woman of means. And Phoebe had the means, and how do we know this? Well, she had the means to travel from port to port throughout Europe and throughout the the Roman Empire. Uh, She seems to have had some business in Rome, and perhaps she was a businesswoman. We've seen that in the Bible before, and there's a woman named Lydia in Acts chapter 16, a seller of expensive purple things. So Paul uh, trusted her to carry this letter to the church at Rome. And she is described in verse 2 as having been a helper of many, even a helper of Paul. And that word helper, it just means um, it carries with it the basic idea of being a benefactor or a patron, or in her case, a patroness of others. She had the means to be a benefactor uh, of several or two several gospel ministers, helping to support them in their ministry. Um, And so Paul says, uh, so we have a a, a, a wealthy woman and the the world would want to Uh, honor that. But Paul says the best two things that he can say about Phoebe. Number one, he says she is our sister in Christ. She's in Christ. That's the greatest thing you can be is in Christ. A believer, a Christian, someone who has put their faith and trust in Christ for your salvation. First and foremost, Paul commends Phoebe to the church because she's in the family of God. She's a sister. Secondly, the second important thing he says about her is that she's a servant. Specifically, Phoebe was a servant of her own local church, the church in Centria. Phoebe probably held some sort of official responsibility there in the church because that word servant is connected to the specific church of Centria. She, perhaps she was in charge of ministering to the needs of women and widows in that church, maybe even some teaching responsibilities with those women, women and discipleship responsibilities. At any rate, Paul commends Phoebe to the church at Rome and exhorts them to, to give her a reception that is worthy of saints, worthy of fellow believers in Christ. They must honor her and meet her physical needs. That's worthy of saints. And the reason Paul makes such a commendation is that she is a sister and that she is one who serves the church well. How did Phoebe serve her church? What did she do? Well, she sacrificed in service. She sacrificed her time and her treasure. See, uh, think about her time. It takes time to help others or to serve in the ministry of a church. You, you are not in charge of your own time when you have to do a task that is benefit, benefiting other people. You have to dedicate your time to that. And so she dedicates her time in whatever capacity the church required. And she dedicated her treasure. Phoebe was one of several women of wealth who loved Jesus in the New Testament. You have Mary and Martha who ministered to the needs of Jesus while he was on earth. You have Lydia in Acts chapter 16. And here you have Phoebe. She's a cheerful giver. uh, And she does that for the sake of the gospel. You know, there are many causes and organizations and needs in our community, in our country, in our community also. And these are vying for your time and your treasure. And some of those are are worthy causes. Some of them are worthless causes and you shouldn't give them a penny, but some of them are worthy causes and it's good to get involved in these things. But none are more important to a sister or brother in Christ than service to your local church. Now, I'm, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't get involved in community projects like, like youth sports or I, there's this Mawikwa in motion thing. I think I find that intriguing um, or the powwow or whatever's going on in the, in the community. I don't, I'm not saying we shouldn't be involved in those sorts of things, but here's what I am saying. I'm saying if you, if you have to make a choice, if you cannot do both, then you choose your local church over the community project. Always, 100% of the time. And we have Phoebe as our example. Um, She was a servant and a servant in her local church. And um, look at a a, a second servant here in this 
passage of scripture. We have a, a woman named Mary. This is not Mary, the mother of Jesus, but another Mary. Um, and he, so he greets her in verse six, greet Mary who labored much for us. Now we don't know much about Mary, but briefly Paul tells us two, uh, uh, two things about her. One, she purposefully served God's servants. He uses the term for us, us being Paul and his evangelistic team. So this lady had served, had, had, had uh, labored for them. And, and what she did, the second thing we know about her is that what she did, she did with all her might. She didn't go a, a, a half effort into this. It says she labored much for us. Whatever Mary did, she did it with all her might, like we read in Colossians 3, 23, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. Or Romans 12, 11, not lagging in diligent fervence in spirit, serving the Lord. You know, um, I think our, our volunteers here at Grace Baptist Church are, are, are great. I mean, I, I know a lot of churches that don't have the percentage of volunteers that we have in our, in our church, and our volunteers do a great job when they are volunteering. And you know, uh, this, is a, this can be an issue, though. It can become a problem throughout all, all churches, and the, and the problem with volunteer work is that volunteers aren't afraid to get fired. In fact, some of them want to, right? That's the problem. I mean, you don't want to get fired from your, from your job because that pays you money and pays your bills, right? But, um, but there can be a tendency in any volunteer work to start thinking, you know, I don't have to show up on time or be dedicated or work hard or take care of this job. I mean, what are they going to do? Fire me? I kind of joke with people, you know, I'll tell Tim or something like that, you know, I'm going to slash your pay. I'm going to cut your pay in half. And, you know, and, and he's shaking in his boots because half of zero is, you know, we kind of joke about that. Uh, I'm, and, and, and people can get to the point where they're thinking, well, I, they ought to be just happy I showed up at all, you know. And let me add, now, if you're volunteering for just anything, I, I get it, you know. But when we're serving the Lord, is that the right attitude? Even if the person that asks you to serve, maybe you don't just don't like them very much or you don't get along with them well, and that's when it's easy to have that attitude, right? Um, or they don't work as hard as you do, <laughs> all right? Uh, so uh, there, there's a proper time and space to discuss maybe ministry worker abuse because that can be a thing. That's, that's a legitimate issue is people can get burned out um, when they're just constantly uh, asked to do too much. But I think the pendulum in America has swung way far in the opposite direction. Um, and so to keep our focus, we must always keep in mind who it is that we are serving, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I remember when I was in college and we sang in the college choir and we would sing Handel's Messiah every, every year at the end of November. Um, and that was a blast to sing. But once in a while, our, our choir director, Dr. Earl Holloway, would stop when we were, we, you know, you, you sing the same music over and over and over again. You get a little tired of it, right? And here it is in the afternoon. I'm looking forward to going to my job as soon as I can, right after he dismisses. And we need to get out of here so I can get there on time and stuff like that. And once in a while, he would stop and he would just say, you know, we're doing this for Jesus. Think about who you're singing for. And then he would talk about how Jesus is the King of Kings and Lord of Lord and worthy of all of our worship. And sometimes we just needed to be reminded about that on a Wednesday afternoon when we were tired, you know. And, and, um, and we ought to, in any capacity that we serve in our church, remember who we are serving and the pay is immense. You say, I don't get paid for it, Pastor. Oh, yeah, you do. All right. Payday just says it hasn't come yet. All right. Payday will come in full when, when the, we stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and a glorious, unending day. And you'll be surprised at how generous the King of Kings and Lord of Lords will be. Like Phoebe and like Mary, let's serve the Lord in our local church. Let's serve him first. Let's serve him well. And let's serve him with our time and our treasure. One of the greatest things anyone could ever say about you is to call you a servant of the church.
Now I said there's four commendable Christian characteristics, so I better move along faster. First, we had service. God commends gospel service. Secondly, God commends gospel riskiness. Riskiness, all right? We ought to be risk takers for the gospel. The people who have done great things for the Lord over the centuries have been people who risked much in that endeavor. And the people who do not risk anything, you've never heard of them and you never will. God commends gospel riskiness. We live in a risk averse culture, at least when it comes to things that matter. And Christians follow that trend. It seems like the greatest goal these days is just to live more days, to survive longer. But that's not how it has always been. I think about not long ago, Jim Elliott, January 8th marked the anniversary of his death. Jim Elliott, uh, the missionary pilot who lost his life for Christ, January 8th, 1956, he said, I seek not a long life, but a full one like you, Lord Jesus. And then he, his more famous quote, he said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And I, I, I think of risk takers for Christ like Corey Ten Boom, who said the measure of a life after all is not its duration, but its donation. We know Corey Ten Boom as the Dutch woman who during Nazi concentration or, or Nazi occupation in World War II helped many Jews escape the death camps and was caught and put in a concentration camp herself and barely survived and lost most of her family. And this woman said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Jesus Christ put it this way. He said, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. God commends to us the characteristic of being a risk taker for Christ. He does that by commending to us what we believe is a married couple, um, Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila. And, and the, 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 these, these people, these married, this married couple, uh, they take calculated risks. They're not, they're not adrenaline junkies just doing stupid stuff, but they will risk all for the gospel. The gospel is their purpose of risk. And so Paul mentions them in verses 3 through 5. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Paul knew Priscilla and Aquila from Corinth, where he had met them and, and found them to be in the tent making trade that Paul was also in. He used that to, to, to help support himself. And so they hit it right off. And at some point, Paul's life was in danger as they were ministering together. And that is when this intrepid, gospel loving couple stepped up and they saved his life. Now, we don't know exactly when that was or what happened. But whatever happened, it was a matter in which they themselves might have been killed. Why? Because they were more concerned about the gospel mission going forward than they were concerned about taking their next breath. These are the kind of Christians for which churches give thanks. These are the kind of Christians who bless missionaries. So Paul says, I give thanks for them. And the churches of, of the Gentiles give thanks for them. And so now, what kind of people are these risk takers? Are they super brave? Are they reckless? Are they adrenaline junkies performing dangerous stunts to get TikTok views in an adrenaline rush? No, that's not what they're doing. God does not commend jumping off of temple pinnacles just to see how good the angels are at protecting you. No, these people are, what are they? Are they saints with extra grace then? Do they just not have fear? No. Let me tell you what kind of people take these risks for the gospel. The people of commendable riskiness are gospel ministers. 
The, the people willing to die for Christ are the people who are already living for him. Because they, like Paul, have already died daily. They have denied self. They have taken up their crosses. And now they are following Christ. May we desire our lives to count more than we desire for our lives to continue. We don't uh, do that by practicing bravery. We, we, we do that by laying down our lives for Christ and for his gospel every day. And so God mentions these four commendable Christian characteristics. One is that simply service. Another one is gospel riskiness. Look with me at the third characteristic that God commends to us, and that is independent courage. The Lord loves for believers to go against the flow of thought in their surrounding cultures. We don't do that just to be, just to be irritable, but where culture contradicts the truth of God. He honors Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who, when everyone else bowed down before the golden image, they stood tall, obviously standing out of the crowd, right? Daniel chapter 3, we read it earlier. And they answered the king's rage by saying, we don't know if our God will save us from this fiery furnace or not. It's up to him. But regardless, we want you to know that we will stand while everyone else bows to your command. And if we burn, we burn. But we will not worship. We will not bow. That's independent courage. Doing what everyone else is not doing. God commands us to be gospel mavericks. You know that? He, he, he does so by example. And it's the guy I can barely pronounce uh, but in verse 5, greet my beloved Epinetus. I'm going to say it that way, Epinetus. I'm not sure if that's right, but I struggled with this name the last couple of weeks. But greet my beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Notice the word that Paul uses to describe Epinetus. He says he's the first fruits. He was the first fruits of Achaia. That was given to Christ. What, is, what does that mean? First fruits is a poetic way of saying that Epinetus was the first convert from his region of the Roman Empire that came to Christ. It is the idea of a tithe of grain in the Old Testament. The tithe was the first part of the harvest, and it was harvested and then brought to the temple as a sacrifice to the Lord. It was literally the first grains picked. And so Epinetus was the first soul harvested for Christ in Achaia, a region of Asia Minor in modern Turkey in the Roman Empire. And so you say, well, pastor, what's the big deal about that? Well, think about it this way. When Epinetus decided to repent and to believe the gospel, nobody else was doing that. All his friends, all his family, all his acquaintances were not standing with him. They were all bowed down to the golden images. He came to Christ all by himself, totally against the flow of thought and the values of everyone around him. He was not a follower of the crowd. Epinetus was a courageous believer, independent of the general consensus of society and even of his family. He was a maverick for doing that, and Paul calls him beloved. God commends this maverick spirit to us. It's so easy just to do what everybody else is doing, right? You have so much less trouble in your life if you just, if you just go with the flow. Some people reject the gospel because they are afraid of what others will think. Others refuse to dedicate their lives to Christ because they don't see other people doing that. And they're just waiting to see who else is going to do this. But Epinetus didn't look to others. He looked to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Oh, that God would make gospel mavericks out of us. Perhaps some of you were the first to come to Christ in your family. You, you didn't do it because others went before you. you. You repented and believed Christ, even though you knew that what you were doing would be contradicting the culture of your own family. And you, that didn't stop you. God opened your eyes to this, to this grace in Christ, and you realized your sin and, your, and, and the salvation freely offered to you in Jesus Christ. And with nobody going before you, and with nobody standing with you, you walked through the narrow gate of salvation in Jesus Christ, and you did that alone. 
<laughs> well, not really alone. He walked with you, right? But you did not follow a crowd like Brother Epinetus. You are a gospel maverick. And Christ honors that kind of faith. And that's a gospel maverick faith that does not just exist when you come to faith in Christ, but it is part of the Christian life. I think about Eric Little a hundred years ago. This is the 19, or this is 2024, so it's the 100th anniversary of the parent of uh, the Paris Olympiad. So they're doing the Olympic Games in Paris again this year. Well, a hundred years ago in Paris. Eric Little, one of my heroes, so you hear about him all the time. I'm sorry, you just have to do it again. Uh, but uh, he was called the Flying Scotsman, one of the fastest human beings on the planet. And in 1924, the Olympic Games came along and Eric Little uh, found out that his, his event was scheduled on Sunday and he refused to run because Sunday was the Lord's Day in his in his vocabulary, he would say it's the Sabbath, the Christian Sabbath, but it's the Lord's Day. And all of Great Britain slandered him and attacked him. All the newspapers and all the, all the pressure was on him. Just, just do it this one time. Do it for your country. Don't you love your country? And Little stuck to his guns and ran a different event, event, an event he was not favored to win, an event that did not favor his skill set, and, and he was not trained for, and yet he won the gold medal anyway. Eric Little later said this. He said, every Christian should live a God-guided life. If you are not guided by God, you will be guided by someone or something else. The Christian who hasn't the sense of guidance in his life is missing something vital. If Eric Little was guided by anything other than God, he would have floated dead like a dead fish along the current culture. That was a hundred years ago. Independent courage comes from being a God guided Christian. Epinetus was a maverick like that and God honors him by putting his name in eternal holy scripture. There, you know, there's a, a million Christians floating like dead fish down the river of popular culture. And you've never heard of any of them because they never move except for where the water is taking them. I'm not saying such people are not believers. I, I, think, I think that their salvation, they're saved. Um, but I think we should want to be more like Eric Little. And Jim Elliott is a hero, not Michael Jordan. Not Pat Mahomes or Elon Musk or whoever. I've got nothing against those guys, but they're not the heroes to which we should look. God commends four characteristics for us. So the, the first one is gospel servants. The, the second one is gospel riskiness. And then independent courage or uh, being a gospel maverick. Lastly, God commends to us gospel perseverance. A lifelong run of serving the Lord is a beautiful thing to behold. It is a life full of trials and temptations. And there are plenty of failures in, in that life, but real believers do not walk away from the faith. And when God saves a person, that person will persevere in the faith until the end of this life when his faith is made sight. God commends gospel perseverance. And we find that perseverance in the examples of Andronicus and Junia. Andronicus and Junia, they were two faithful Jewish Christians, and they demonstrated their perseverance in faith through two great obstacles that they overcame. One is the obstacle of time, and the second is the obstacle of trials. They persevered through much time. He says, greet Andronicus, verse 7, and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Paul says they were in Christ before he was in Christ. And at this point, as Paul is writing the letter to the, to the Romans, he has been a believer for many, many years. And so Andronicus and Junia uh, had been faithful even longer than that, long decades. And they had, uh, in, in that faithfulness had encouraged Paul. 
So they had persevered through the obstacle of time. They also had persevered through many, many trials. And Paul calls, he calls them here his fellow prisoners and his countrymen. Countrymen simply means that they are of the same nationality. That is, they are Jews. Paul is Jewish. And then he calls them fellow prisoners. And what does that mean? Does that mean that they robbed banks together? No, it means that they preached the gospel together and they were thrown in prison for that. I don't know if they were in prison at the same time in the same place, but they were in prison for the same thing. And that's why Paul calls them fellow prisoners for the gospel. Now, you have endured so far this morning the obstacle of time, and I thank you for persevering, all right? And so I have much more to say on this this, um, characteristic of perseverance, and we are going to flesh out this point after dinner. And so we'll just kind of recap here. There are commendable Christian characteristics. God commends to us the the characteristic of gospel service and of riskiness for the gospel and independent courage and perseverance. And if someone who loves Jesus and knows you well would write a one-sentence summary of your life, what would they say? Would their summary include some of these characteristics or all of them or would it be something that mentions Christ first or would other things come to mind and uh, I, I, uh, I want us to consider that because these things are not just things that Paul had to think deeply about to try and come up with something for his friends they were things that were right on the tip of, the, of his tongue as he wrote their names down And such things should be true of us in that way.